You are watching Wellness Wednesday. I'm with my very good buddy from the Genwell Project, Pete Bambachi. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, Gooch. How are you, my friend? I am fantastic. Anytime I can have you on the show, and now with the Jock Doc, the Jock Doc, what, he, the, dyna the dynamic duo. Duo. That's amazing. No, no. Who doesn't, who doesn't love to talk to a Jock Doc? Well, we're both jocks, so now we can talk to the doc about all our ailments. But seriously, on Wellness Wednesday, it's all about just informing people about good health, good practices, uh, and of course, with uh, with our jock talk, we will learn a tremendous amount about just staying healthy. And then he's got an incredible project that he's developing this uh, database to help collect information for concussions as you know as young jake comes up through the you know uh the the hockey ranks you as a parent want to know that he's going to be taken care of when it comes to that injury and uh, dr gary's going to do that yeah honestly i'm excited for this conversation because not only you know we're all about prevention on wellness wednesdays but uh, understanding how to manage through uh situations like concussions is really important because i think a lot of us get into it Again, it's what we've talked about a lot, uh, Gooch. It's, you know, don't wait for the crisis. Inform yourself before so that when the situation arises, you know what to do and what steps to take. So uh, great. Uh, looking forward to hearing uh, all the advice. And at a time when a lot of people are looking to, you know, find out what we're doing next, how are we coming back, where are we going, and being prepared for what comes back. You know what, and I think that's really important. We'll talk to uh, – I call him the jock dog, but it's just so cool. And like, I'm Goosh. I don't know why your nickname's Pete, or I'll just call you Genwell Project, or you're the project. But I just like talking to guys like this because he's so invested in, in protecting. And you and I both have said this. We are so, we, as humans, we're so uh, learned of uh, the crisis. Let's solve it. But why don't we prevent the crisis before it actually becomes a crisis? And I think that's what uh, his group is doing uh, to say, listen, we all know there's a problem. It's like the NHL, no disrespect. I don't point a finger to anybody. It's like COVID. You know what? There was no handbook given out to the leaders to say, okay, guys, this is how you deal with it. So we're all kind of swimming, doing the backstroke. So we need people like uh, the doc, doc, uh, Dr. Gary to come in and give us a real good perspective on how do we, I wouldn't even call it prevent, how do we, collect the data so that when somebody does get hurt, we know what to do and who to send them to. And, and so, you know, the one thing I'll also say, uh, Gooch, is I think this is really important. You know, oftentimes with the Genwell Project, you know, uh, initially when we talked about social connection and, and belonging, people thought it was a senior's issue. But what we need to recognize is that it's a societal issue, that we need greater human connection. And I think when it comes to concussions, we need to recognize that this isn't the issue of the patient. This is the issue of every player, every manager, every coach, every parent to actually yep. educate each other on the things that we can do to prevent the concussion from happening. It's about, and we've heard this for a decade now, if not longer, it's about respect, mutual respect for each other and, and recognizing when there's somebody who's vulnerable, don't take that shot because it may actually result in that person being hurt or injured. We saw a situ situation in the NHL just last week. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it's sad to see it because I love good body contact, but I also hate when I see uh, things like you're, that. You're referencing Tom Wilson. It was a, a hit that, you know, obviously has to be taken out of the game. There's no question. Listen, we're really excited. 25 years of experience. He's down in I, – I think we're going to change it from Jock Doc to Hollywood Doc. Look at this dude. <laughs> Dr. Gary, how are you, buddy? Hi. Yeah, Doc Hollywood. That's me. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> so thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, you know, Pete and I do this every uh, Wednesday. We, we we bring in guests that are, that are very informed. And one of the things that we really like about your platform, obviously, you're more than a concussion doctor. You're going to tell us exactly like you're – uh, you know, your, your extensive uh, uh, re uh, resume here. What's important that you've been involved with the U.S. Olympic Committee, the Red Bull ath uh, Athletes, I think it's called. You, I guess you took care of all those crazy guys that are jumping from, I don't know, mountains and stuff like that. And, and the L.A. Blades. 
So, and, and you've dealt with a lot of rodeo. You have done it all. And not only in concussion, but walk us through how you a, have become known as the jock doc. Well, I, you know, that jock doc, uh, nickname was something somebody gave me because uh, I was always a frustrated jock. I was never good enough to be what I wanted to be. Yeah. Uh, my claim to fame was skiing and uh, racing, and and uh, I played some amateur hockey, but I loved taking care of uh, athletes. So um, I, it, it just kind of naturally followed, and I really enjoy it. I, I got to tell you one of my funniest stories, though, about taking care yeah. of professional athletes was – one of the Red Bull guys, uh, we were working with uh, the Red Bull athletes, and I get a call from my uh, one of my office managers that had contact with them, and they said, oh, we got one of the wingsuit guys coming in. Uh, do you have time to see him today? And I went, oh, God, yeah, you know, bring him in, bring him in. I said, and I'm thinking to myself, do I need to take time, uh, get time already in the operating room. How bad is this guy going to be hurt? And the guy comes in and uh, I, I I asked him, I said, so uh, what's wrong? What happened? And I'm expecting this guy to be picked up with a sponge. And he goes, well, I was in the surf with my five-year-old and a wave hit me from the back and I twisted my knee. And I just looked at him and I said, that's your story? That's what happened. I mean, I said, come on, I need a better story than that just for cocktail parties. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but hang on, Doc. I got to ask you this question. When you said wingman, I thought it was the guy that was with you at the bar. You know, he was your winger. Well, but, the, you know, the guys that wear the squirrel suits and jump off mountains. They're, they're amazing. Know, oh, they're crazy. You know, isn't that odd? That, you know, how to do that. How often do we hear about, you know, a player in any sport of all leagues who falls down in the shower, who trips down the stairs at home and they're out for six weeks and you're like, hold on, you play one of the roughest, toughest sports in the world and you fell down in the shower or, you know, twisted your happens knee with a five-year-old? Haps happens all the time. Really? <laughs> yeah. So they're human. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Plus, you know, the you know, good. Athletes get injured. You know, it, my my old um, axiom was, you know, life is a contact sport here, folks. It's None it. of us get out of this unscathed. And it's not a matter of if you're going to come see me. It's just when. Yeah. And, and I think that's important to what you just said, too. And it, it relates back to what we'll talk about in a few minutes is obviously the concussion platform that you're working on. Uh, life is a contact sport or contact activities. And a lot of people say, oh God, he's playing hockey. You know, that's a contact sport. No, no, you can fall off a swing set. You can fall off a bike. You could, you know, there's still a, a number of activities that people say, yeah, how'd you get concussed doing that? You know, I, I'll tell you one real quick one. There was a lady that uh, she was living in her apartment and the people next door, it's in my book, the concussed it was an actually a crazy story. What happened was, is that the guy next door had his speaker, his bass speakers set up against her wall and he would be at late, you know, turning up the bass. And she had a Buddha on, on one of her bookshelves that was over top of her bed. And it kept moving and moving and moving. And years, it hit her, popped her in the head. Imagine going into a doctor saying, listen, I've, I bumped my head. A Buddha fell off the, off the shelf. Well, you, you so, all need good cocktail party talk. <laughs> yeah. so, hey, listen, talk to us about you know, your interest Gooch, interestingly about that, there was a recent study that came out looking at uh, traumatic brain injury in, in college students. And surprisingly enough, non-athletic traumatic brain injury outweighed uh, sports concussions two to one. Yes, and and that's been a well documented study. Now, whether they you know fell off a bar stool or off a, you know when they're drunk, it it the the problem is not just athletes. Now, obviously, my center is or my my goal is not the professional athlete, but the scholastic or academic athlete. You know, college high school, elementary school, and younger, 
that are participating in sports because we know that these concussions and some injuries are cumulative in nature. You know, you get one, then another, then another, and all of a sudden we have uh, crescendoing injuries. Yeah. So, you know, that's what we, that's the education part of this is to let parents know that, look, this can happen on a playground. This can happen in sports. Obvi you know, as we talked about last time, football is obviously the biggest one here in the States uh, for concussions. But the second most common is girls soccer. And um, most people don't know that. And then you start looking at men's hockey, but you've got uh, rugby, you have rodeo, you have uh, sledding, uh, bobsleds. These guys all get uh, – there's a huge number of traumatic brain injuries in uh, cheerleading that these girls fall from uh, when they're doing the tumbling or they're doing those yeah. uh, pyramids. Synchronized swimming. Not as much, but well, no, but as they come out of the pool, seriously, I know I had three calls on that. So I thought, wow, <laughs> three. How, how yeah, do they you? Slip I'm not even talking about the the head. story. That's a cocktail party story. Listen, look, look, you know, look yes, we're please. not going to wrap our kids in bubble wrap and cotton so that they're not going to get anything wrong. Um, we can't helicopter over them. Kids are going to be kids and athletes are going to take risks. These are choices we make. And the older we get, we make certain choices based on our lifestyles and our wants, needs, and desires. You guys turned professional athletes. You knew the risks involved. You, you get somebody at the NHL level, they know there's high risk. It's a high velocity collision sport. And there's risks involved. And like you said, we want to not target the head. We want to put certain rules in that protect the athlete in the long haul. But it's for the younger athletes that we need to be a little more proactive in protecting them because they're not going to take have the ability to make those cognitive choices. Right. Hey, Gary, when you talk about the cumulative impact of the concussion – Mm -hmm. is the starting point, if you start at a teen versus you get one at 25, is there a different impact or is it the same impact wherever you start? And it's just, you know, obviously the later you start, I guess, is the better because you got through more years. But is there a different impact on it different ages? It seems to be the younger has further, much more impact, especially wow. with learning disabilities and long term psychiatric problems. I mean, let's be clear. When we're talking about an injury of this magnitude, whether it's just getting their, quote, bell rung, and they got, eh, you know, I'm a little, yeah, that really hurt. I'm a little disoriented. Okay, I'm better. That all plays a part. Yeah. And we don't know actually how it affects the brain. There are some interesting studies coming out where they're trying to measure certain proteins in the blood after concussions. You know, we don't even have a good definition for what is a concussion. And it's multifactorial because we're not, well, not only looking at cognitive, you know, how do I reason? How does my brain function in a thinking pattern? But there's psychiatric implications, there's learning disabilities, there's sleep disorder. There's balance, there's ocular movement, um, there's uh, a coordination between balance and movement, and we need a lot more research into this. And don't forget, it's only been really about 10 years that we, really we in the medical community, have defined uh, cumulative trauma uh encephalopathy the yeah. cte that we see then that was uh brought out in the movie concussion right and that, that, and that obviously it's chris nowinski who's 
who's brought that to the forefront. Uh, he took a challenge. He was a, a WWE wrestler and, uh, you know, certainly has come a long way to help us understand it better. And, and I think what's really important is that I wanted to get from you, Gary, obviously you're an orthoscopic surgeon to start. Uh, tell us how you you do that and then branch off into being, you know, taking care of the brain because it's very important for people to understand that uh, you're, you're not – just one lane. You're you're taking care no, of my. I, I I treat. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and my specialty has been sports, and specifically knee, shoulder. And I was in association with a group that we did a tremendous amount of uh, spine surgery uh, for discs and necks and things like that. Uh, so we always work together, and it's a team approach. Uh, I started treating athletes uh, because I was a knee specialist and shoulder specialist. I was very early on in the arthroscopic world and, and developing minimally invasive surgery for the knee and the shoulder, which led, because I, I loved skiing, it led me to doing a lot of ACLs and, you know, skiing with a lot of my patients when I practiced in Aspen. And uh, shoulders, uh, there was a Dr. Harvard Elman, who is a very good friend of mine, who published the initial work on shoulder arthroscopy. And I did a number of one of the very early shoulder arthroscopy uh, situations and, and treatment. And I think what we have learned is that Sometimes the most conservative thing we can do is to be aggressive in treating a patient. And that's especially true with instabilities of the knee, like um, tears of the ACL. You know, you, when I trained in the dark ages a million years ago, um, we would do open meniscectomies. And I remember my professors would Put a cast on a patient and they couldn't walk for six weeks. Well, in those days, the, the cure was worse than the problem. And then arthroscopy began to develop and we noticed that, gee, you know, if we spare the meniscus and we only take out the torn portion, that patients do better. And then ACLs, it used to be the same thing. It I called it the... Uh, there was a, a time when it was the operation, quote, only it's so complicated, only I could do it, you know, the surgeon would say. And then it became a, with arthroscopy and more and more studies, became a much more uh, popular procedure. We knew it spared uh, the meniscus. We know that it gave stability to the knee. Same with shoulders. I mean, uh, in the older days, we wouldn't operate on rotator cuff tears until they were massive, and we only saw them in older adults. With the advent of uh, arthroscopy of the shoulder, we were able to intercede earlier and prevent these massive rotator cuff tears. Now we see it that we're doing uh, more hip arthroscopy and in working on the hip. We see this in our goalies all the time where they have tears of the labrum of the hip, which is that gasket. And now we're able to intercede. And so, you know, if you take the knee, for example, we do this many uh, arthroscopic procedures and this many total joints. In the hip nowadays, we're doing this many total joints and this many hip arthroscopies. Oh. So as we become more and more advanced in what we do, and understand the anatomy better, we can intercede earlier and prevent the need for total joint replacements and degenerative arthritis. I mean, the real buzzword in orthopedics today, and especially sports medicine, is number one, injury prevention, and number two, cartilage preser preservation. How do we preserve the cartilage in the normal cartilage in your knees or your hips or your shoulders so that you don't, they don't wear out. 
Yeah. And that's where we're getting into biologics now, using uh, stem cells, using uh, uh, PRP, which is uh, platelet-rich proteins to inject into the joints to preserve the articular cartilage. And we're looking at procedures to see how do we preserve that and how do we keep from damaging that very de delicate and necessary hyaline cartilage. You know, cartilage is, you, you've all seen the end of a chicken bone where it's white and glistening, and that's what articular cartilage is. And the best analogy is like a new Teflon pan. You know, it's real nice and smooth and glistening, and you put the egg on, it comes right out. And after you used it a few years and you've dug it out because you've used the knife and a fork, it's all you know, like, like gravelly. Well, yeah. that's what, that's what arthritis is. It's that wearing away of that articular cartilage. And hey, that's, Pete. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Gary. Pete. No, that's okay. And that's what we're we trying to preserve. Thank God we got the jock talk now. He may be able to extend our uh, men's league career. Yeah. Hey, I've had, yeah. I've had three, my knees done three times to remove some cartilage, but those procedures you're talking about, Gary, those are to repair once you've damaged it, is there anything like I, you know, we're all, we've all been told to stretch. Is that the, when we talk about prevention to prevent the first injury, is that really the, that's the only, that's really the only thing, right? Strengthening, I guess. Strengthening, Strengthening. and stretch. Well, let me give you a perfect example of where research is for prevention. Studies have shown, for example, that the female athlete has a much higher risk of ACL injuries. In uh, volleyball, I think it's eight to one. Basketball, it's about five to one. Uh, and skiing, it's about four to one that women will have more ACL tears than men. And they, there's been a lot of research as to why. And people have looked at the shape of the intercondylar notch of the knee joint. People have looked at musculature. People And studies have shown, for example, that men are usually quadriceps strong. So when they come down from a jump, their quads fire. Whereas in women, because of the way they're built or their own particular musculature, they seem to be more hamstring strong. So there has been a lot of work done on teaching women how to land from a jump and fire and dif train differently. There's been research on, and I think we talked about this last time, they were looking at, there was a very sophisticated study where they were measuring squeaks on the floor between men's basketball and women's basketball. And there were more squeaks in men's basketball. And they were trying to figure out why. And they looked at the shoes. And they found that the women's shoes were basically just downsized men's basketball shoes. And that the coefficient of friction was higher in those shoes than men's. And it may have contributed to the higher ACL tears. And the ski industry has been very active in developing equipment specifically built for women. The way the boot flexes, the way the binding releases, the way the ski flexes. And it, it seems to be working. I don't know. But I haven't done the research. Uh, but these are things that, how do we prevent it? We change the training protocols. For example, uh, marathon runners. You know, it used to be, well, you got to run a marathon to qualify for a marathon or to train for it. Now the training is, well, let's increase pace, not speed. I mean, uh, not distance. Let's tr keep the training under a certain amount of mileage and increase the velocity that you're running or for the speed, you're running the same distance, and that will give you a better aerobic push. You know, with bicycling, the positioning of the seat, the positioning of the pedals, all makes a difference in injury prevention. 
And that's the stuff that we learn through research and biomechanics. So and I have I have yeah. a six year old Gary, and so uh -huh. we talk we talk about prevention for the body. Let's talk about concussions. Is there anything I can do? And I I'll, I'll, I hate to say to prepare my son for uh, a concussion. And we played uh, hockey on the backyard rink all all winter. I don't think we had any of those situations, but. It, well, when you were I thought that was a little. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I thought, you know, when you, when look, you dude, some goose, checking your six-year-old, checking your six-year-old into the boards is not good not parenting. Good. No, okay, that's not good parenting. So, you know, and, and taking him out, of, you know, tripping him, it, it, you know, all the dirty tricks. Come I on. And so is or on you. But but seriously, is there is there anything that parents can do? Like, because again, I I think and no, I think it's I the think Canadian, it's Canadian Hockey League or the Canadian Hockey Association created those stop buttons that went on the back of the jerseys that encouraged everybody just to be more respectful. But to the kid who's out there trying to look out for himself or in preparation for a game, what can what can they do? Well, I think they need to wear helmets. I know the kids wear full face masks. Uh, I know that the, they're non-check leagues up until, what is it, 16? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I talked to Jerry West, the, the old uh, Laker, about this when he was coaching and managing years ago. And he, his suggestion was don't keep score. Don't even keep score till those 16. Learn the, the basics of the game. Learn how to skate, to stop, to stick handle. Look, accidents are going to happen. We know that in these cases, helmets help. Do they prevent a concussion? No way, no how. But what we want to do is educate the parents not to ignore symptoms that if it happens, let's get some baselines before the kid starts. And that's what we're trying to do with Codeum and our, our company, is let's get so the parents have in their possession, it's their data. We put the basics on. You know, look, does the kid have a learning disability? Have there been prior concussions? What medications are they on? Do they have other, uh, you know, medical problems? Now you got something. Then when they go to the to a sport, if they're in a team, you have your pre-participation information. You do the cognitive testing, the balance testing, whatever it is that we're going to put in. All right. Now that you've got some information that's usable. Then if something happens, at least somebody can document what's going on. You know, on the pro level, it's not a problem. You got ATCs, you got neurologists, you got trainers, you got chiropractors, you got massage therapists. Not a problem there getting the data. It's when, look, mom and dad are coaching or it's a club team that somebody's got to take responsibility. And that's where the education, not only of the parent, but of the club or the uh, hockey association comes in and says, look, we understand there can be a potential problem. How do we get involved and educate everybody along this to prevent the long-term effect? And then how do we start managing it down the line? All right? You don't get a bump on the head. That's one thing. Not every kid with a bump on the head you're going to rush to the emergency room, get x-rays, MRI studies. You're going to observe them. And a lot of the things that come out are long-term or weeks down the road. Now, gee, you know, little uh, Wayne got a hit on the head. He was playing and he got checked and he was a little loopy for five, ten minutes. But he went back in and played. But two, three weeks later, man... He's not doing well in school. He's having problems sleeping. You know, his, his memory's a little off or there's mood changes. 
he's beating up his little brother all a lot more than he usually does, or he's withdrawn. These are things we want to look for and be aware of. And it's a matter, I think, of awareness. You know, um, the more that we know about this, it's about acceptance of what is. Okay, Wayne got a hit. Now, you know, I got to accept that there may be something going on. And, and and utilize this information to prevent it in the future. Are we going to prevent all injuries or all concussions? No way. They're going to happen. They're going to happen when you ski, you know, you hit an ice patch, you go back, you whack your head, boom. That happens. Life mm. is a contact sport, as I said. We, You know, but through education, through, through learning – setting certain paradigms up of, all right, we're going to use, for example, in our app, AI to predict what test we need and to get the payers to say, hey, all right, little Wayne here needs uh, some counseling or needs something. And now we have the data to back up our decision making. And I, I really... I think that's amazing, Gary, because I honestly, it is, and maybe uh, I don't think I'm unusual as a parent, but if you asked me to track uh, certainly, you know, anything that had to do with true data where we were measuring, you know, a kid year to year, having that baseline to go off of every year to do a fresh set of tests on that, that, you know, I'm sure there's a series of tests that you can just kind of refer back to if an, if an incident happens that you can go ba back and say, look, at the start of the year, here's how the, this kid was doing. Here's how he was testing. Here's, you know, if there was some qualitative comments about, you know, how he got along with other people. I don't, maybe you don't have to go into that level because I think you want to stick to the data piece. But what an amazing way to really judge the impact of that concussion and 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 how that child has res uh, has uh, been impacted based on, well, on the incident. Take it. Take it to the next level. Let's take it. You got a 16 year old now who's really getting good at hockey. And you know, at 16, they're starting to hit. They're starting to really play a much more aggressive game. And you have a kid that comes in and he's had eh, maybe he had a concussion when he was 12. And now you've got your baseline and he's had a couple of bad hits. And now at the end of the season, You've got something to compare to. And that's, I mean, that is so important to be able to give to the, to the treater. Yeah. You know, we, we talked to some guys, um, uh, your buddy Gooch, uh, I just, Scott Holler. On Scott Holler. Uh, Hall, yeah, Scott Holler. And, they're trying to put together a program for guys that are or gals that are kind of been impacted late and and have ongoing symptoms and he's coming it from the other direction to educate the treaters and and the caregivers which is so vital and what i'm trying to do is connect the dots and say okay let's get mom and dad involved because they're the ones that are observing their kids all the time. You know, it, look, I have parents that I have one family and I love them to death. Uh, and the father and the son, uh, the father was a fire captain or is a fire captain and uh, was captain of the, uh, the football team for the LA heat. And uh, which is the firefighters football. And he and his son are total motocross guys. And uh, I always tease that I'm building a wing in my house just under their name, you know, dedicated by because they're always getting oh, hurt. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, if you have the data now, if he's getting racked up on a regular basis and he wants to make a career out of motocross, man, that data is vital for him moving forward. And not only that, you take this data, 
you have best practices now, which we're building into the app. And you can take this. And when the insurance company says, nah, he doesn't need an MRI or he doesn't need a neurology consult, you go, well, wait a minute. We have already gotten all the criteria together that you want. Here it is. How can you say it's not indicated now? Hey, uh, Gary, let me ask Pete. That's very vital. Pete, I want to ask you because Jake is coming up as a young athlete and you know he's going to play hockey already. The kid can skate like a, like the wind. How do you feel what Gary's just said about having more of a an idea as a parent, having a little bit more control? Because right now it's all a crapshoot, right? We're we're kind of blinded, and and the kid shows up to you, uh, uh, and says to you, Gary, "Hey, listen, parents, show up. My, my kid's not. There's something wrong. Tell me what's wrong." And you're just you're trying to figure it all out, and you may not know that young boy or girl's history. It would help you if you did know they had certain predispositions or or whatever. And here's how it happened. So, Pete, how would that feel for you to know that? Dr. Gary has all that information about your son when you're bringing him in. You feel it's because it's not a knee and it's not a, it's not a shoulder. It's your child's brain. Yeah. And I think, you know, Gooch, it's a great question. And, and Gary, I love where you're, where you're going with this because at the end of the day, and we were touching on it a bit there. I have no idea about concussions all other than watching the movie, listening to Gooch, watching these shows. And I'm learning as we go here, but if we you said, all are. Yeah, we and, all are. There's no definition of what's a concussion. And, and I think the idea of, hey, if you gave me 10 to 15 tests that I could, you know, some might be computer responding to light or, you know, if, and maybe it's touching your toes and standing on one leg. I don't know what the tests are. But if you gave me a series of tests that I could put my six-year-old through right now and say, today, here's where he is. And then, you know, he has a couple bad hits and all of a sudden he, he's, he doesn't see him himself, but we've got these measurements on these tools that we were able to test now. That's what we're trying to put together. That is like, to me, Gooch, that's worth a million dollars. So we, because... we've had, yeah. So there has been studies done or, or there are some platforms, of course, with, with impact. And, you know, again, it's also that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Dr. Gary, um, it's also very important to understand that once you have all that data, you know, the, the child's brain changes, you know, drastically over a, a very short period of time. So, but you also have to, it's who is reading that or validating that information, right? Because oh, good well, information look, is, we're, not, we're not turning the, the care over to the parent entirely. No, what we're trying to do is just give a more complete database that is user-friendly that you own, okay? This is your kids. You have priority. You've collected this. You can use it any way you want. You can take them to the doctor and say, or the pediatrician or the psych or whatever, and say, look, you know, little Johnny has had, so, he's been diagnosed as ADD and he's on medication. And he's been doing fine. But all of a sudden he got this hit. And now I have collected this data. Now it gives me information that I can make critical choices and critical uh, diagnostic decisions. It gives me an algorithm to follow. Okay. Right. You know, it, it, it's like a roadmap. You know, you get to point A. Well, did this happen or this happen? Oh, do I do go right or go left? Or do I stay the course? And all of this data helps with these decision-making algorithms. You know, it's like a guy with a knee sprain that comes in. Do I jump on an MRI immediately? No, I'm going to examine him. All right, does he have a swollen knee? Am I going to see if there's blood in the knee? Then I may examine him. I may want to wait, take an x-ray. I may want to wait a week or two, see how he responds. Or I may decide to get an MRI right away based on my physical examination. Then I may get additional information, say, okay, this needs surgery or doesn't need surgery. Now I've made the decision he needs surgery. What course do I follow? What procedure is going to be best for this individual? Right. 
And that's the failure today is insurance carriers want cookbook medicine. They want a one size fits all. And it just doesn't work that way. We have indications, but I can't tell you the number of times that I had a patient and you have somebody on the other end of the phone say, well, did they have a positive McMurray's test? Well, who cares? The only person that was important to was McMurray who got his name attached to it. Did he, did he have six weeks of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or use a brace? No, he's got a lock knee. Come on. It, it, he doesn't need these things. I've been practicing 30 years. What do I need a, you know, a high school graduate telling me how to practice my medicine based on a menu checkoff from the insurance carrier? And look, there's been abuses on both sides. There's guys that will operate on anything, anytime, all the time. You want to choose a physician that has integrity, just like anybody else. You want integrity. And, and that's what we try to do or hope to do. Um, but the powers that be that hold the purse strings are controlling medicine today. Right. And why, that's why we want the parents to control this data. And, and that makes sense. And it would make you, Pete, obviously much more. And that's why Scott Holler actually got into the concussion space. He was an osteopath and his young daughter was, that's how I met him. And that's why I was so impressed with him. He wasn't doing it because he knew he was going to make a wow. millionaire. He got in it because he knew his daughter was going to go. And you've heard this guy. He was, she was going to go play. And he was not scared of her getting a concussion. He, he was scared of what, who diagnoses it and deals with it afterwards. And so I because really did. You know, the average treating physician doesn't really understand concussion. And, you know, along those same lines, Gooch, the developer of our app, uh, I may be the mouthpiece, but he's the brains and the developer of the app. He got into it because his son had a terrible concussion and a very unusual concussion um, because it affected brainstem, which is very unusual. And he got into it because he couldn't get his son diagnosed. They said, oh, well, it's ADD. Oh, well, he has a learning disability. Oh, well, he has a psychiatric problem. And it took a long time to finally make the diagnosis. And he went to a myriad of specialists until somebody came up with, well, you know, probably happened from a concussion. And this is this was the starting point. And I that's where I think, you know, Dr. Holleran's um, work is 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 incredibly vital. You, you know, know I, I think his training of caregivers, whether they're ATCs or physician's assistant or GPs or specialists, is phenomenal. And it's needed. It's badly yeah. needed. As I as I listen to you describe the, the situation with the knee and looking back at the history, I think this is the thing that we all need to recognize is that without that information, unfortunately, you don't have the opportunity to draw blood from the brain. Like, I'm assuming uh, I'm I'm no doctor, so you know You're all not. those all the yeah, was it was it obvious? I'm just kidding. You got uh, but, the beautiful one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, come on, you're growing the little white hair there. Come on. Hey, I paint that in just to look more mature. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> no, but I, I think when, when I listened to you talking about the knee, uh, Gary, for me it was like, hey, a knee. And we've all we've probably all had bad knees at one time, and you're like, okay, well, I can see how you could do all those checks before you get to a surgery. The challenge with the brain, without that that information, you can't do all those checks that you do on a knee or a shoulder or you know other things. So I, yeah, I'm well, uh, to be honest with you, I'm I'm I love hearing what you're working on because. My kid hasn't gotten into big sport yet. He's six. He's just getting there, and, and I kid, love that idea. Kid. Yeah. Yeah. Get ready. Jake's going to be one of those guys. But well, I really you know, value it. Yeah. I got into it through my associate, Bruce Adams, who was the developer of the program. 
great guy. And, you know, we just talked this through. And I said, you know, there's a need here, man. Let's run with the ball. Hey, Gary. So we've got a really good team together, I think, to get this going. You've got going. a great team with Jeff. And, of course, you've uh, talked with myself. And Scott and I will will get back on track with that. Uh, can I tell him who uh, who Mr. Adams' brother is? I don't care. <laughs> sure, I guess. Summer of 69. Brian Adams. You got yeah, it. Okay. I have to tell you that because that's amazing. I, I was on the phone with the dude. It's, okay, Kate, can you get me an autograph from your brother? Um, so talk to walk us through this now process, if you don't mind, because it's really important that you, you, you've explained it. You, you've articulated it very well. We, we, as you know, Peter, you've got it as a parent. How now the next part is is getting buy-in. You gotta you gotta try, you know, it's been a long time, as you know, Gary, to get doctors to start spending some time understanding the word concussion. Because concussion well, is just a you know, word for, for a brain injury. Right. You know, uh, like any business, the financing and getting it off the ground is always the hardest part. And we are in the phases of getting our beta test model ready to roll. But, you know, financing is tough nowadays. Um, to answer your question, how do we get people to recognize it? I think your answer is forums like this, more discussion, uh, understanding that the pro sports are now at least acknowledging that it's a problem. Yeah. The NFL is acknowledging that it's a problem. The NHL is saying, yeah, you know, hits to the head can be career ending. We're acknowledging it. For years, they wouldn't even accept it. You know, ah, no, it's just, but now it's out there. The research has been done. We know that CTE is real, a real thing. Um, Education, talking about it, getting it out there, talking to now organizations, being able to approach, for example, AYSO soccer um, or uh, U.S. hockey to say, hey, look, how about coming on board with us? How about sponsoring a club and you buy the app and supply it to the club? for a minimal charge. Yeah. Um, getting sponsors, getting people like CCM or, or you know, Red Bull or, or Gatorade to say, hey, you know what? We put Powerade on all our, you see it being dumped. It's all over the television. You see advertising. Come on, come up to the plate and help us with this. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do. So in a, in, a, education. Yeah, in a perfect world, obviously, Pete, what you're hearing for the first time, I know a little bit of the background of it. Um, obviously, you as a parent would be very interested in su such a thing. So how do, how do you, I know we have forms and we can knock on doors and that. When do you, when do you feel it is time to do that? Like once you get the financing in place, how long do you think to getting the financing and bring it to the market and getting people to buy uh, in. We are what? hoping within six months to have it to market. Okay, wow. Yeah, we, we're at the point that we think that if the financing comes through the way we plan it, um, that probably six, the outside nine months, we would have in a uh, form ready to be utilized on a 1.0 level and this is going to be an ongoing program that understand the more data we collect the more valuable it becomes because then we are our, our predictions uh for the ai and best practices be, becomes that much better the more data we have the better it becomes 
You know, I know you, you mentioned Powerade and obviously brands that you think of uh, maybe south of the border. When I think of uh, youth sport up here, I think of uh, Canadian Tire. I think of uh, Tim Hortons for Tim Hortons soccer and hockey. I think of Bank of Montreal, who's pretty big on community sports. You know, these teams, th these companies are involved in getting kids out and active. And that's the original inspiration was being part of the community. And I think for a few dollars more, because I can't imagine, you know, if you were going to sign up every kid playing a recreational sport in, you know, the U.S. or Canada, you know, we're talking millions of people that are going to be using this on an annual basis, that it, it would have, there'd have to be some cost efficiencies there in using the app that it wouldn't cost the sponsors uh, significantly more to what they're paying for the, the brand on the jersey, the socks, the this, that, and the other, whatever the sport is. And, and to be able to put your brand and say, hey, we at Tim Hortons, we at Bank of Montreal want to step up because this is about prevention. This is about keeping your kid in the game. This is about keeping your kid healthy and happy and contributing to society for the rest of his life by taking these simple steps. Yeah. To me, I think there should be brands banging down the door so that they actually, rather than just connecting your, your name to a jersey, it's actually to a really meaningful thing. Well, that, that's, that's, our, that's certainly our goal. But as you know, in any business. Always a challenge. Always a challenge. <laughs> uh, lawyers want to yeah. get in and, and uh, make things more complicated than they need to be. No offense to any lawyers out there, but. I don't take offense. Uh, let me, let me, ask you, <laughs> let me ask <laughs> Let me ask you a question, guys. I want to. I want to hear. You. You're both. Par I. 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 Unfortunately, I was not a father, but you know, I didn't have children. But I've had many children around me, of course, just because of the the nature of my being a pro player and stuff. And I, you know, I have a lot of kids that I, I adore, and I just I would do anything for them. So my question to you: Why wouldn't a parent just automatically understanding what you're building, Gary? Why would I know you? I, I know you need fun, funding to do that. But you, as a parent, would you not want to be the one to say, "Listen, if it's going to cost," I'm just using a number, so don't. It's going to cost me 25 bucks a year to have this app, uh, and I'm going to have that data at my disposal. And really? I would why almost like an insurance pay each year. It's it's not a knee. It's a brain. Why can't yep. we as a society come up with that plan? Well, I, I, the answer is I don't know. I mean, that our goal, our goal is to make this so affordable for the average family that it's a no-brainer. Do you know, they did a study out of, um, I believe it was um, uh, University of Utah. The average cost for a year and they took an average i think the average income was $66,000 a year US and the average amount spent for children's sports for one child for sport for the year was i think 5500 bucks was spent and that included uniforms game stuff travel you know Yep. Hockey is a little more because of the uniforms. That was about seventy five hundred a year. Yep. Come on, a hundred bucks more for the app. But 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 Gary, what I think is even more. Yeah. What's even more important than that, and Pete, you may have not have gone through it yet, but just if you have a child that God forsake has a concussion and you need to do take them to all these therapies and they can't play, you're putting not only putting money out but you're also, your child's not playing, but the amount of time and energy that you need just finding, you said it, you know, you could go to four or five different doctors. Not every one of them has, listen, you could go to a, a, an emergency center in the city of Toronto and get four different diagnoses from five different hospitals of what it is. So we need to galvanize this and centralize it. And I think that's what your platform can well, do. That's what we're trying yeah. to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's an old adage, you know, if you if three orthopedists are in a room and you ask their opinion, you get four different opinions because one guy's not going to be able to make up his mind. Yeah, or it's a double person. Um, yeah. 
look, uh, what we're trying to do, really, and I, 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 to bottom line it, I think it's about education, putting the data in the hands of the people that need it, the parent who then can use that data to whomever caregiver they want to give. And now you have something that it's the interpretation from the caregiver. You go to Dr. X and you say, look, here's the data. And he goes, oh, okay. I think this, you know, but I don't handle this. Maybe you ought to see Dr. Y or a neurologist on this. And here's my opinion. Now you have his opinion, but you have the data. And you say, you don't have to repeat the story. Again, and, oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot to tell you that he had this done, or I forgot to tell you he had that done. Now you go to Dr. Y and you say, here's the daddy gug. Oh, you know, I didn't see that the first time, but boy, look at that. That's an important factor. And, you know, I do a lot of medical legal stuff too, and I can't tell you how vital when you look at the medical records on somebody and say, Absolutely. oh, what was really done? The, the patient will say, well, I had a rotator cuff tear. I, I don't know. He stuck something in my shoulder and ground away some bone. Well, what was really done? I got to see the operative report. Yeah. I, you know, most patients, they don't know what was done. I got a couple of holes in my shoulder and <laughs> doctor fixed it. I don't know. It works now. <laughs> you know, you know it, it's interesting. This whole conversation, and Carrie, you were talking about this right off the top, which is about uh, we as a society like to live. It's not that we like. We live in crisis. We don't take preventative action until we're in the crisis. And, mm -hmm. and I know uh, at least a couple friends who had kids who, in one case, and it was a soccer, to Gary's point, it was a soccer collision. And I think he was dark rooms, beds, couldn't function, couldn't work, couldn't focus. I'm going to say it's over five years. Wow. So when you look at the, uh, yeah. the impact of a 25, if, if 20, and we're just using that as a number, mm -hmm. of a $25 investment, to potentially support a young person going through, and frankly, somebody of any age, going through uh, a concussion, having to deal with it, wouldn't you want to bring the best information? And, and frankly, that living in crisis is no different than the Gen Well Project. We're encouraging people to stay socially connected, but most of us take it for granted until it's too late and we're in the crisis and then we need to build that Social We're in that network. crisis now, and yeah. I'm in it, certainly. I have an 11-year-old little girl, great kid, and I think, you know, she, the her only connection now due to COVID is, is through the internet and through social media and Zooming her friends. I mean, the only way she has contact to school is through Zoom. Yeah. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing with this social disconnect. And especially here in the States and in LA, forget it. I mean, you know, people are in their cars or they're on the computer. There, there's no central town where people socialize. And now we can't because of COVID. Right. Although God bless with the, you know, the uh, vaccinations were a little light at the end of the tunnel. But I I think that this social interaction one-on-one is, is, -on -one is really hard. I mean, look, we would have a much better conversation and a much more one-on-one -on -one if we were sitting in the same room. Absolutely, yeah. Or you could say after this, okay, that was great. That was fun. Let's go get a beer, guys. No, I, I need red wine. Hey, listen, All right. I want to add to that. I, I just want it's really good. Sam Trapolino, who's helping us in Adelaide, Australia, his young daughter was hurt in, in, a, in, a, in a playing hockey. She fell in love with the game and she got hurt. And he was fortunate that he knew me and was able to talk to Natalie, who's one of our specialists in, in Australia, and also with Scott through the internet. Right. And he basically said to me, Gooch, if I didn't know you, I would have allowed her to go back and play. I, I didn't know. She just said she had a headache and her neck was a little sore. 
I, we would have let her go. And once he explained it to me. So I think that's what this is all about. The more we communicate, the more we talk about it, the more that we're out front and the more that you can get that particular platform in place so that a parent can feel, because right now it's a crapshoot. You, you go to a, a medical doctor and I'm not, listen, I, I have no, I got to grade 12, passed grade six twice. I cannot criticize anybody that has a formal education and has a DR in front of it. But just because you have DR in front of you doesn't mean you know specifically about that. And that's why I, I love your approach, Gary, is because you are thinking before the injury happens. And that's what we need to start doing more and more. And that's what you said about the general project. We have to be more prepared. The pandemic, pandemic is going to change and should change the way we think. We have to be better prepared. And when you have a six, an eight, or a 10-year-old going out your door, and they're coming back, and they're complaining about certain things, don't just pass it off onto it. If you knew they were playing, if you knew they were on a bike, if you knew they were on a swing set, ask the right questions. Because we're talking about a brain, not about... You know, and it goes back to the same thing. If I'm going to go out and ski for the season, you better yep. bet your bottom dollar the f two months before... I'm going to be strengthening my legs and stretching and and trying to get in shape. Right. Why? I want to prevent a tear. Yep. I don't want to be a. I don't want to hit a mogul and crash. I want to be able to recover. I just want to go straight down, put the skis down, and just fly. But uh, can't do that anymore because my knees will fall apart. Hey, listen, uh, uh, the jock doc. We've taken up a lot of your time. We really, really appreciate it. My I think pleasure, guys. I think you've enlightened, and that's why I wanted Pete on it because of the fact that you've enlightened somebody that has a child, and now that he understands what you're putting together or trying to put together, and I know it's going to come to fruition, uh, we're really excited. We're we're, we're really uh, excited about being a part of it well, and, and helping. Thank you. I want to thank you for giving me a venue to at least explain this and get our project off the ground. Uh, Pete, I feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, Gooch can give you all my information. And, you know, if the if the listeners have questions or viewers have questions, you know, Gooch, you can give me my email. I answer yeah. all my emails. Well, there's one here, and I, we, it'll be a long answer. So I'm, I'm going to – I'll send that to you. Uh, it's about a knee thing. So thank you for that. Listen, we really look forward to getting you back on in a couple, maybe a month or so, so we can find out how you've updated. And, you know, you and I'll be talking anyways. And I can't wait till the three of us get an opportunity to do exactly that. You two can go for a beer and I'll have a nice glass of red wine. Uh, nice California. I'll bring red. one of those California uh, reds up for you. All right, buddy. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. How nice was that guy? Unbelievable. That's amazing. I love the work he's doing because, again, yep. and, and this is what Wellness Wednesday is all about, Gooch. It's about prevention. Yep. And it, whether it's concussions, social connection, your health in any which way, uh, we have to all start thinking about what we can do to keep ourselves healthy. Because whether it's the health system or whether it's the government and all the, the money that's being put out there, the, it, it isn't there to cover us at all times. So the best thing we can do is do all we can to stay healthy before, you know, the definition of insanity, I'll finish off with this. You know, we've always said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. I think the definition of insanity is waiting until people are sick before we try to help them. Wasn't that and, Einstein? Yeah, it was. That yeah. was good. You just picked oh. up that quote. But I, I got to tell you, this was a selfish show. I'm not, let's be honest. Now we know the jock talk. And there we go. My knees are in trouble. I can, I can, look at, I told you about this. I got frozen shoulder, right? And the only reason why I got it is because I scored so many goals. So now I'm going to have to go down. Once we get out of pandemic, he doesn't know it. I'm coming to see him. <laughs> All right, buddy. I really appreciate the time and energy that you put in. I love the, I love that you paint, you know, you, you gave us the little look with the, uh, you know, that, that spray painted silver <laughs> in your, your beard to look, uh, just and to look I did a little it, more mature. Well, I did it up here, right? Cause I can't grow a beard. So I just put it up here. You're an amazing man. The general uh, project, make sure you check that out. Please be connected. And you know what? Tomorrow, take a minute, phone somebody. Great idea. Do it right now. Just make sure you reach out and connect because we need make you. Nobody knows how important that call may be. So, uh, thank you, bud. Love you. Well said, my friend. Take care. Have a good night. Good night.